On behalf of the entire Children with Diabetes team, I am so excited to see all of you here this morning. My name is Lee Fickling and I am a diabetes mom from North Carolina. Today, I have the honor of sharing this stage with two of my heroes who have literally saved my diabetes life more times than I could ever count. You know her name from the Facebook page, and you've likely, likely seen her in the hallways of Coronado, quietly putting in miles every single day as she watches and builds and double checks and make sure that the magic of Friends for Life is happening. She's the first to offer a hug to a stranger, and she's also the first to offer a bedroom to her house. She's a diabetes mom who's been there and who has done that for over 20 years, and she's part of the very foundation who has made all of this possible today. I'm proud to introduce to you this morning Children with Diabetes Vice President of Education and Programs and one of my very best friends for life, Laura Bilodeau. Oh, she didn't tell me she was going to say that. This is one of my most happy times when I'm standing on this stage talking to all of you. Um, so welcome. I hope you're having a good start to your morning. Uh, I have kind of a funny story to start off with. Where's Disney Michelle? Where are you? Are you here? Disney Michelle. So she's kind of my partner in crime here. There she is. Everybody say hi to Disney Michelle. So I had printed uh, or had a Word document with my notes on it, and I sent it to her and I said, can you please print this really big so that I can sit up here and like go through my cards, and remember what I'm supposed to talk about. And so what she sent me is like a scroll. It's giant. Lost in translation, my fault. Anyway, where's our picture of Richard Rubin? There he is. Richard Rubin was a fiffle. He wore many hats, but to us, this was the most important one. His life was like ours. Growing up, he had a sister with type one. As an adult, he had a son with type one. He remembered the old days of boiling syringes and checking urine. He was a CWD dad. Richard was also a psychologist. He was one of the best in the world when it came to helping families with type one. He spoke at our first Friends for Life conference and then pretty much every single one after that, even the smaller ones. He would do regular presentations about stress and living with type one, but then he also asked us to schedule his time each day full of 10 minute appointments back to back that he would call 10 minute tune-ups. You'd show up to meet with Richard. He'd say, have a seat. What do you want to talk about? It could be anything. Richard taught me early on that life is about achieving balance. To each person that means something a bit different. And to each person, it truly is equally important balance. As we officially open the conference with this keynote presentation named for Richard, I'd like to ask each of you to think about balance. The week at Friends for Life and then when you go home to your work and school and summer vacations and all the stresses that make up a day, balance. Now, I'd like to introduce the keynote speaker which I've always wanted to do. And even though I'm in charge, I never get to. I met Jeff Hitchcock face to face for the first time in 1999. I drove the four hours from my house in Michigan to his house in Ohio to hand him our very first sponsorship check for $10,000. I knocked on his door. It was terrifying. 
This was the Jeff Hitchcock, the famous Jeff Hitchcock. He and Brenda had invited me to dinner and to stay overnight at their house. It was terrifying. Fast forward, our two families, along with many of yours, we embarked on two decades of holding about 100 conferences. We celebrated our 20th anniversary of Friends for Life Orlando in 2019. We had a big celebration. Many of you were there. That was fun, wasn't it, dressing up? And then stupid COVID. The next couple of years for us in CWD were a real struggle. How do we ever hold conferences again? Do we ever hold conferences again? Yes, we do. So here we are looking ahead at the next decade. But first, let's take a look back at how we got here, where we are right now, and the path into the future. And who better to do that than the one and only, truly terrifying, Jeff Hitchcock. Thank you. Um, the only people who have called me terrifying before were my children when they were young. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, as Laura said, my name is Jeff Hitchcock. I founded Children with Diabetes in 1995 with the simple goal of sharing our family's story. And I'm going to take you a little bit on a journey on how we came to be part of this family, things we've done here, and other things we do that most people don't truly understand. So here is my wife, Brenda, and I, a very, very long time ago, a very, very far away, and I actually once had brown hair. So we met in 1983 in Kinshasa, Zaire, as I said, a long way away. We got married about a year and a day after we met. A couple of years later, baby Marissa. Always one of my fam favorite photos. We lived in Washington, D.C. That summer, it was ferociously hot. And Marissa was always thirsty, begging for water. And this is her second birthday, August 31st, and she has type 1 diabetes, and we didn't quite know it yet. When she was four, my wife packed her in the back of our Toyota Corolla, drove her off to Camp Glendon, an ADA camp in Maryland. No fear. She received an award for summoning the courage to give herself her first insulin shot at four. Next year, I went to camp. There's Marissa sitting up on that little sign. I was in a bunk with teenage boys and other dads. And I remember vividly a mom coming in and berating her son. And I don't remember what, but I, I could see him crawl inside of himself. And I said, I would, I would never be that dad. A year later, this was Marissa's lowest blood sugar, 17 milligrams per deciliter. That's her great grandmother. Back then, there were no sensors. The fastest blood glucose check took 120 seconds. I want you to think, count to 120 before you know just how low it is. So we were squirting cake mate frosting into her mouth, which we did often. It's a great low treatment. Don't use red because it will stain the floor of your minivan when she throws it up. <clears throat> we relocated to Cincinnati in 1994. I promptly was laid off in 1995, and I called my internet provider and said I'd like a full-time 
288 modem connection, I'm going to launch a website sharing our family's story. And that fall, I actually made a little t-shirt. Marissa's wearing the first CWD shirt. She's on the left. That's Catherine in the middle. And my son, Tim, on the far right. He is in elementary right now, and he's always mortified when I show this photo. Marissa got her first pump at 11. Thankfully, we don't use that much tape anymore. And she wore her pump to prom. And as I tell people, if her date knew where it was, I would have had to take his arm off. <laughs> She got her driver's license at 16. Our family likes to drive. My dad, uh, who passed away a year ago, was the only person I know who lost a driver's license twice in two states at the same time for speeding tickets. Marissa hops in that car, and I get a, I get a note from her one day. Hey, Dad, do you know the Corolla goes 100? <laughs> Which I said, that's my girl. <laughs> Senior high school portraits. You see the insulin pump? It's tucked there in her waistband. It's part of her, but it doesn't define her. She graduates from high school with a couple of her raucous friends. They all decide to go to nursing school. I double Velcro taped the glucagon to her bedpost, just in case. Knock on something that resembles wood. She's never needed a rescue. She meets Adam in college during clinicals. They graduate as nurses. She gets a job offer in Tampa, Florida. They pack all their worldly belongings into the back of a U-Haul trailer, attach it to my wife's Honda Pilot, drive to Tampa, keep the pilot. <laughs> they move back to Cincinnati to get married. And they give us Baxter, <laughs> my grand dog. He is so wonderful. Many of you have met Baxter. Um, he is superb. But then they share this. And two FFLs later, Connor runs on stage into my arm at the banquet. I would sit down at home and he would just run to me. So I knew he would do it on cue. A few years later, they adopted Everly. They moved to Stanford, Bruce Buckingham. I don't know if Bruce is in the audience. Bruce is a, a wonderful friend, a pediatric endocrinologist at Stanford who researches artificial pancreas systems. And a few years ago, he caught me in the hall here in Orlando, very much like Adam asking for permission to marry my daughter. He asked permission to recruit her to leave Cincinnati and move to California to work for him, which she did. And here are three young women who met here at Friends for Life, Monica, Marissa, and Sarah, all of whom worked at Stanford. This photo from last year is really why we are here. Richard taught us to fit diabetes into our life, not the other way around. So this is why we do diabetes. So a little bit more about life with type one, kind of enough about me. Elliot Joslin was a pioneer of diabetes care in the United States, namesake Joslin Center. And he's quoted as saying, the person with diabetes who knows the most lives the longest. And that was true in the 1920s, and it's just as true today. And the reason this really hits home is represented on this little slide. So a friend of mine named Manny Hernandez, who lives with type one, took the blue circle representing diabetes at the United Nations and in the international community and cut a little wedge on the top. And that little white wedge represents the time of the year in which we, the families living with type one diabetes, spend with our healthcare team. It is mere hours. And the other 99.98% of the year, 
we care for type one ourselves and with our fiffles. And it's a real testament on how important it is to know how to take care of diabetes. Our organization, Children with Diabetes, is a US nonprofit. I'm not going to read this, but we've done events around the world in the US, Canada, the UK. We participate in conferences that are put on by professional organizations. And we come here every July because there's no place we'd rather be than Orlando in July <laughs> with you. We have an esteemed board of directors, many of whom should be in the audience. Board of directors, could you stand if you are here? I would like to thank all of them. Because behind every organization that is successful is a board that is exemplary. Last year, we doubled the number of staff we had. It was always Laura and myself. We had Beth as a project manager. And we hired Marissa, my daughter, as our clinical director, Matt Point as our director of advancement, and Sasha Squibb as our creative director. Because, well, yes, definitely applaud to all of them. Sadly, Marissa cannot be here because a week ago she tested positive for COVID. And Kenny Rodenheiser has stepped up as our acting clinical director. So a, a definite kudos to Kenny. We also could not be here without the incredible generosity of the people at these organizations. And notice I said the people at these organizations because that's really important. We have dear friends who work for these companies who believe in our mission, enough to fight to make sure that we have the funding necessary to put events like this on so that you can learn and as Elliot Joslin says, know the most and live the longest. So when you go into the exhibition hall today, take a moment and thank them because what they do makes what we do possible. For those of you who care, um, about 66% of our revenue is related to conferences and 75% of our expenses are related to conferences. That's not exactly a good number. So Matt is here to help you help us. I mentioned we began as a website. That website actually lived on a little Microsoft computer in my house for many, many years. And my, my kids will tell you that we had to redo our air conditioning system because the servers were overheating the basement. We don't do that anymore, thankfully. We live on the cloud like everyone else. The website shows the creative spirit of Sasha and Matt. As a mathematician, I'm eternally grateful for that. When COVID happened, as Laura alluded, we had to think quickly about how we served our families. And we came up with two digital offerings that we continue today. One is called Screenside Chats, and the other is Masterpiece Product Theaters. The Screenside Chats were a chance for us through Zoom to connect and share how do we live well. It's a, it's a clinical kind of topic led by Marissa and Matt, and we do those about once a month. The Masterpiece Product Theaters were an opportunity for us to let our friends at sponsors share the innovation that they, uh, that they were working on. How do we find new tools to care better for ourselves and our family? Each week since June of 1995, we have sent out an email newsletter. It is now called the Weekly Diabetes. How many of you subscribe? You should all subscribe. It's got some cool stuff. Sasha and Matt own it again, so it looks way better than it did at the beginning. And then we have a Moffle meetup every other week online. And I saw a picture from the Barcelona bar of a mob of Moffles. Yes, how many of you were there? Great. Um, the Moffle chats are bring your own wine, but you can definitely do that. 
Every other week we get online, my wife is there, others, uh, to just to catch up. Every week we, we publish an article of clinical significance. This is a way to kind of catch those clinical tune-ups, not the Richard 10 minute psychology tune-ups, but a little bit more to learn every week. We also share links to important news stories and research articles that our team feels you should know about. This all gets back to Elliot Joslin, the person who knows the most lives the longest. In about July or August of 1995, I got an email, dear Dr. Hitchcock. I am, I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one on the internet, but I recruited some healthcare professionals to answer these questions. And over the years, we've addressed about 18,000 questions on every topic imaginable in diabetes, including diabetes in cats and dogs. We once had a vet on the team. We have a great social media presence. Again, thanks to our younger generation. And I actually met a young woman from Cincinnati who found out about us on TikTok. Are you here? I'm looking around. Ah, over there. So we're not on TikTok yet, but uh, that's, that's on the plan. This is our digital reach last year. We're very, very happy with it. But what we really are is what we are here, friends for life. This began when Laura sent an email to our parents' email support list in late 99, asking if anyone wanted to share a vacation with her family in Orlando in June of 2000. Now imagine this, go back to 1989, probably 1999. The internet's still pretty new. You come home from work and your spouse says, we're gonna take a vacation with our imaginary friends. <laughs> Well, 550 of us showed up to this. They couldn't spell children and they couldn't spell diabetes. <laughs> Laura asked our families, what do you wanna do next? And everyone said, gosh, I want a real event. I want science. I wanna meet the sponsors. I want social events. So Laura and I came over here and met with Disney and we looked at Coronado H, so one third of this room, that spot right over there. And we stood at that door and said, how are we gonna fill this room? And now we take the entire facility. And in 2000, those two arrows point to Marissa on the left and Sam on the right. Those were all of the kids of type one who were at that gathering. It was hot, it was humid, that was SeaWorld, but we had a lot of fun. So in 2001, we came back, we did a real event. Gary Hall Jr., the Olympian who had been diagnosed with type one diabetes and was told he'd never swim again, came and joined us. So he's up on the edge of the pool, he's in his golf shirt and swim shorts, he's talking about how he trained for the Olympics, how he, he was able to do this and he takes his shirt off to go in the pool and all the moms gasp. <laughs> A team from the Diabetes Research Institute, which had pioneered islet cell transplantation, came and did an islet transplant on a teddy bear to show our kids what was coming. In 2002, we went out to California. I had met a gentleman named John Ratzenberger who played Cliff on Cheers. Any of you know that? You gotta kind of be old to know Cheers. But what you also don't know is John has a son with type one diabetes, and he's also the only actor who has been in every single Pixar movie. They consider him the good luck charm. So John and Monica Lanning opened the exhibition hall. Nicole Johnson came, she was working in the booth for Medtronic. And that little boy walked up and said, I, I hate doing finger sticks, I have dots all over my fingers. Nicole turns her hands down and said, I have them too. In 2003, we came back here, a gentleman named Will Cross joined us to uh, start the fun run. Will Cross was the first person with type one diabetes to summit Mount Everest. And I realized if you can stand at the top of the mount, at the top of the world with type one diabetes, there's nothing you cannot do. Two young women from Denmark came 
Previous year, some of us had gone to Copenhagen to visit the plant where infusion sets are made for insulin pumps. I would recommend that if you choose to go to Copenhagen, you do not do it in November. <laughs> 2004, we went back, a gentleman named Douglas Cairns came to join us. So Douglas was an RAF fighter pilot, a trainer, it's kind of like one of their top gun guys. And he goes in for his flight physical, he wasn't feeling quite well. And the, the uh, physician says, Douglas, you have type one diabetes and you were a pilot. Well, Douglas would have none of that. He came to the United States, formed an organization called Diabetes World Flight, got a twin engine beach, pulled out all the excess weight, put in fuel tanks and began to set world records in time and distance. Because in the United States, you could, become a, you could get a pilot's license with type one diabetes as long as you had someone else in the cockpit with you. Through Douglas's work over many, many years in advances in care, you can now be a commercial pilot with type one diabetes, as you saw at the Dexcom first timers meeting, which is awesome. We also took over the Globe Theater and I, one of my biggest memories there, and I don't have it is Lauren Landing's husband, Steve, getting taped up with uh, uh, toilet paper roll as a mummy. In 2005, we came back here uh, another pilot, Michael Hunter, who is here to join us. I don't know if Michael's in the room. Michael is an acrobatic pilot. And at the time there was a glucose meter that had a built-in cartridge. So he could Velcro that to his cockpit dash and while upside down, check his glucose levels. And it was the first year we did retinal screening. I had gone to the American Diabetes Conference in June of that year and met a gentleman named Ben Zerth. And I, he was doing retinal screening. And I said, um, are you busy next month? You wanna come and screen some kids with type one? And they've been doing it ever since. In 2006, we had a gentleman join us named Kevin Covey. He was on, what's the, American Idol. Very great voice. What we used to do in the banquet is we would have our sponsors come up and kind of, we would gently embarrass them and they would have to dance. Kevin rescued them all. And we had a very special first timer and I know Ken is here. Where are you, Ken? Somewhere, ah, here, where? Okay. So Ken was the Surgeon General of the United States and joins us in full regalia. And I remember sitting afterwards in the bar and Ken said, do you know how much money you've saved the US government? I said, no, but do tell. And he said something in the long lines of, because of what you're doing, none of the people here with type one diabetes will ever need a kidney transplant. And the US government through Medicare pays for that. And I said, well, that's great. I'll take a check. <laughs> and now Ken is the chairman of our board. In 2007, we had two really interesting groups come. This first, jet, that little boy kneeling down there who is no longer a little boy was here for a martial arts conference. Some of you who were here early might have seen the tail end of a martial arts event. Well, Lewis was from Australia, was here for that. And I think on the Monday, he started to not feel well. And the nurse for the event said, you got the flu, sit in your room. By Wednesday, it was clear he did not have the flu. He had type one diabetes. Taken to the hospital, we learn of this, and Nabil Alarbi, the gentleman kneeling there, and some of the staff decide they're gonna go jailbreak Lewis from the hospital and carry him into the teen dance. So they get in the van, they go to the hospital, and it's the wrong hospital. <laughs> they eventually find him, they carry him in, and he had a great time. And his family had been back a couple of times since. We also had a group from the United Arab Emirates join us the previous year, Myself and three of the CWD faculty had gone to a diabetes medical event in, in uh, Dubai. We arrived there, we looked at the slide decks and said, we can do better. So we basically took over the entire conference, redid everything, had a great time. And the gentleman on the left there, Ahmed al Hamali, who has a daughter with type one, was one of the group that came. So 50 members of the United Emirates came, we had a great time. In 2008, we did the first dessert, with the post, dessert and posters with the faculty. 
And this on Friday night is something I really urge you to attend. It's a chance to see the tip of the spear of science. I would go to the ADA's scientific sessions in June. I would walk through the posters. I would see all of the really cool science that was coming. And I would watch those posters get thrown in the trash. And I said, that's, that's dumb. We would invite faculty, bring your posters. So on Friday night, we bait you with chocolate covered strawberries and drinks of that and the like and come and you get to actually see what's coming. Sebastian Sasseville, a Canadian, the second person with type one diabetes to climb Everest came and he let you hop in the protective suit he wore to climb the mountain. If he offers that, don't take it. It smells like hockey gear. <laughs> In 2009, our grandparents program began to grow. How many grandparents do we have here? I wanna thank you. Because the one thing my daughter Marissa missed was a weekend alone with her grandparents. The way we cared for type one diabetes when she was young was very different than today. And my parents and my wife's parents were too anxious to take her. There were also no cell phones. So our grandparents program is designed to give you the confidence to take your grandchild for the weekend and give the parents a break. So I encourage you to do that. We also had PJ, a dog with diabetes, join us. And I remember when I shared that we were gonna have a dog with diabetes, some of the parents said, my kid's not a dog, why are you bringing a dog? Well, we brought the dog into the Kitty Cove in the elementary and the vet talked about how important it was to take care of PJ, to check his blood glucose, to make sure he eats well and that he gets exercise. And they all said, well, that sounds like a really good idea. So they learned about themselves through PJ. In 2010, something magical happened. Two teenagers who'd grown up through our program became adults and joined us as staff. And what they're pointing out on that badge is their last name is on the badge. So for those of you who have kids here, you know it's just their first name. That's to, for privacy and, and safety. So they were so happy to have their last name. And we began to have a, more adults find us. Through the magic of the internet, people kind of realized that this is not just for parents of kids, it's for grownups too. And actually, I'll come back to that in a bit. In 2011, a chef with type one joined us and we began to see more and more siblings getting screened at TrialNet. And I'll give a call out to TrialNet, which is around the corner here. All the money in the world and all the scientists in the world can't find an answer to type one diabetes if we, the community living with it, don't participate. So I really encourage all of you, orange bracelets, to go to TrialNet and see how you can help. 2012, Crystal Bowersox came and joined us. She's an amazing uh, sort of country music singer, and she's got that green bracelet on. And we had so many first timers, we ran out of ribbons. And that was about to happen here, but I got them FedEx to my house last Friday. In 2013, we began to see more and more sensors, the technology that we all really, really want, the ability to, to hear our body's diabetes symphony, started to become possible. In 2014, that was the first year for Connor. And as important, the first FFL inspired wedding. So Martin and Chelsea met here as teenagers, got married, and they actually have a baby here now. And there are, there are two families whose kids met here grew up, got married, and have babies here. We're gonna have a great photo in Kitty Cove of all of those kids. 2015, Kevin came back and with Sarah, did an incredible song called We By My Fiffle. It's on our YouTube channel, you can see it. And we began to be an important enough conference in the medical community that devices were introduced here, not at the American Diabetes Association Conference. In 16, Eric Pasley. Any of you Eric Pasley fans here? He gave a rock concert that was to die for. And we held our first fellows program. CWD fellows, why don't you stand up? There's, I think, 10 of you here. 
Are you in the room? I don't know where you are. Ah, up here. So the, the idea behind our fellows program is to take third, fourth year endocrine fellows, psychologists in training, newly minted CD, CESs, it was really easier to say with CDE, um, and bring them to Friends for Life and let them see type one diabetes in the wild. What is it really like to live with type one diabetes? So that they would remember that and take it with them in their career caring for families like us. And it's been an extraordinarily positive program over the years. And, and we really thank the, the couple of organizations who help us make that happen. In 2017, I found that family on the left. Those are two little tiny kids, both diagnosed with type one diabetes. And as those of you who are here will see tomorrow, it gets much quieter on Friday when we send the teens away. <laughs> In 2018, we began to have more and more adults with type one and another country music star named Raylan came and rocked out our banquet. In 2019, a football player named Mark Andrews has type one diabetes came as a guest of Dexcom during their uh, first timer session. And I had a chance to sit next to him at that session and realize just how short I am. Uh, and then just as a reminder that some of our fiffles are pretty small and the bracelets are better on their ankle. And then COVID happened. So we decided we couldn't not do something. So we built a virtual platform using Zoom, which we all kind of love to hate right now. And we had 5,558 people from the, around the world register for our virtual sessions. It was, it was unsatisfying. I don't know how else to say it. So last year, we came back kind of halfway. We worked with Disney. Our team did an incredible amount of work. We had about 960 people here, no COVID spread, which was great. It was exactly at the right time. Vaccines had come, Delta hadn't shown its ugly face and we were able to do that. And those two little girls had grown. And the picture on the right is a real testament to what happens here. The green bracelets find their tribe. You, you meet people who are sharing that same lived experience and it doesn't matter how old you are. All right, a bit about our fiffles. I'm gonna just kind of jump through this, but today what I wanna tell you is this is at this conference, we have 390 adults with type one. Raise your hands. 315 kids. So the adults rule this year. And this, this is a trend that's been happening over the last couple of years and it's gonna continue. And it's reflected in the kind of programming that we do, which is really, really good. Um, when you register, we ask, can you tell us how you take your insulin and whether you have sensors? This is important for us to share with our, our sponsors, get them excited about being here. So we have all of this data and I think it's in the annual report, which you all should have received when you registered. But there's a lot of things we do that people don't know about. And I'm gonna share some of that now. How many of you are familiar with Sparrow Rose? Any of you? So just a few. So I guess about 10 years ago, a group of us from the Diabetes Online community were sitting together in, a, in January, December or January, trying to think of what, what we could do to make a difference in the lives of, of people living with type one anywhere in the world. And I was familiar with a group called Life for a Child, whose sole purpose was to bring insulin and diabetes care supplies to children living in under-resourced countries. Children in countries where they would have otherwise died because there was no way to care for them. So collectively, we decided we would run a campaign Valentine's Day. Buy 11 roses for your sweetheart take the value of the 12th and donate that to life for a child. Spare a rose, save a child. Very simple concept. And over the years, we helped raise several hundred thousand dollars for life for a child, ensuring that tens of thousands of children across the world simply lived. This past year, the world changed in a way that was rather shocking. 
we began to focus our entire efforts on raising funds for families in the Ukraine living with type one diabetes who were refugees. This was the biggest campaign ever. We raised several hundred thousand dollars. Those funds are, at, are on the ground right now helping those families. And, and the four people who have shepherded Sparrow Rose over the last decade are Chris Aldred on the left. Some of you in the community may know him as the Grumpy Pumper. He is from the UK. Bastian Hawk, DDoc, very well known. He is in Germany. Renza Sibilia from Australia. She is known as Diabetogenic. And me, and I'm known as Marissa's dad. I mentioned we do events at other organization events or other conferences. And this is just a couple of pictures from things we've done in the past. We attend a diabetes technology conference known as ATTD, Advanced Technologies and Treatments for Diabetes, the sole purpose of which is to accelerate uh, adoption and, and availability of diabetes care technologies. And we've done dinners and things like that all over. I'm a member of ISPAD, the International Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes, a group of clinicians and psychologists and other allied healthcare professionals whose sole job is to teach healthcare teams in any country in the world how to get the most out of the resources available in that country. And I help do things at those events. Um, oh, back, back. Back. February of, two, of 2020, Madrid, Spain. February. You kind of know where this is going, right? So before I got on a plane to go over there, I was watching the news. There's this strange thing in Wuhan. It's a virus. I go to Home Depot to the paint department and buy out N95 masks, put them in my suitcase, fly to Madrid. This is the last social event in the diabetes world community that happened before COVID hit. We did a dinner celebration of children with diabetes in ISPAD working together for 15 years. And on the right, that's Renza and Carrie Sparling. Many of you know Carrie, six until me. This past year, we were able to go back to the ATTD conference in April and present an award to Moshe Phillip and Tad Badalino, the creators of that event for their leadership in accelerating the adoption of diabetes care technology globally. We minted a very special coin and gave them solid silver ones. And everyone in attendance at that dinner got a bronze replica. This is going to be the dinner event of the, of the conference going forward. It, just uh, last month at, at ADA in New Orleans, uh, we held a whole bunch of events. So the ADA every June holds something called scientific sessions. The largest diabetes conference in North America where people come in from all over the world to hear what's new in diabetes care. And type one diabetes is, is a small sliver of the broader diabetes, but we focus on that. We always hold a dinner event with the ISPAD leadership. We hold receptions and breakfast events in support of our sponsors and in, in, in support of moving education and knowledge forward. Back when you could go to Congress before COVID, we were deeply involved in advocacy efforts in partnership with an organization called the Diabetes Patient Advocacy Council or DPAC. This is a group that works to make sure that policymakers and legislators and legislative aides understand the needs of people living with diabetes. One of the last things we did was we went to an event on the Hill in 2019, invited congressional health aides, those are the people who advise elected officials on what they should vote for, and taught them about the innovation coming in the glucagon area. A lot of laws regarding glucagon are tied to a very specific glucagon device, a mix-up inject device. And we had to make sure that those laws would evolve to reflect the dry powder vaccine, 
and the premixed and available other drugs so that they would be reimbursed and available, particularly for kids in schools. How am I doing on time? All right, but I'm gonna leave you with one last slide. And I show this because it shows the pure joy of life well lived with type one. Our goal is to, to dance on the beach. This is a picture of my daughter Marissa with her not quite yet husband Adam at events we used to hold at Marco Island. That is what I see in your kids and you when I see you in the hallway. I spent yesterday just introducing myself and saying hi to all of you with the blue first timer ribbons. And as I watched, it was clear that you were home. So with that, I will thank you for being here. Have fun. Remember the goal, dance on the beach. Lee, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you so much, everybody. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you again to all of our sponsors. We hope that you will visit with them in, in the exhibit hall today. Quick couple of reminders for all of you. The CWD Journey Award table is going to be open today from 1 to 2.30 in the exhibit hall. Um, there will be medals for 10, 25, 50, and 75 years. Um, so if you're hitting one of those milestones with diabetes, that's for yourself or for a loved one. Um, so if you have a family member or a loved one that's hitting one of those milestones with diabetes, you're welcome to pick up one of those medals for um, an individual that, that also may be hitting one of those milestones too. One to two thirty in the exhibit hall. Um, please pick up your kids if they are in elementary, if you're a parent. Um, they, they need you to pick them up. Um, Kitty Cove parents, if you have made arrangements to pick up your kids during the break, you will also need to pick them up or you need to go back and pick them up at lunch. Tweens and teens, parents, best of luck to you. You will see them sometime today. Um, also, friendly reminder, we would love it if you would rate this session. Please do that now. You can do that on the app or you can do that on the rating sheets that you will find in the middle of the tables. Um, there are paper rating sheets that are on the table with the pen there. We would love to have your comments about this. Um, and again, thank you so much for being part of our Friends for Life family. We're so excited that you're here and we know that this is going to be the best week of your lives. Thanks for joining us.